Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Five Steps for Publication Quality Immunohistochemistry Imaging. Presented by Jason Kilgore, Technical Application Scientist, Thermo Fisher Scientific. I'm Christy Jewell of Roberts and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Roberts and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or you can report your problem by clicking on the Answer Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Jason Kilgore, Technical Application Scientist, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Jason has worked with Thermo Fisher Scientific since 1999. His initial work in research and development focused on the development of dyes and techniques primarily used for microscopy and imaging of cultured cell and tissue section samples. Jason's experience also included leading an R&D group that produced 36 new products and optimized many others. In his current role as a member of the technical support team for cellular analysis and in vitrogen, EVOS, Cell Imaging Systems, Jason helps thousands of researchers a year to develop and optimize their protocols using cell imaging and analysis reagents, kits, and instruments. Prior to coming to Thermo Fisher Scientific, Jason earned a Bachelor of Arts in Biology at Hendricks College and a Master's of Science in Biology at Central Michigan University. Welcome, Jason. You may now begin your presentation. Hi, thank you very much for attending today's webinar on immunohistochemistry. My name is Jason Kilgore. I'm with Thermo Fisher Scientific. I've been here since 1999 when we were initially Molecular Probes Incorporated. I worked in R&D for many years, and uh, including leading a group, and for the last nine to ten years I've been in technical support helping researchers like you. Many of the presentations images today are images that I took, although I do have some from collaborators as well. And many of them are products that I helped develop in R&D, so hopefully this will prove very useful for you. Today we're going to talk about immunohistochemistry, that is antibody labeling of tissues for imaging and microscopy. I should mention also that there are a number of web links in this presentation. Feel free to come back to the recording so that you can see those in time that you have uh, to follow up with them. The recording will also be available later if you should wish to come back and listen to it or have a colleague listen to it. This presentation is going to be presented in five parts, the so-called five steps covered in the webinar. The first part will be to uh, give you uh, helpful hints and tricks and troubleshooting related to preparing your samples, such as mounting, fixation, deparaffinization. Then we'll go on to antigen retrieval or antigen unmasking. Then we'll talk about blocking the background and the many different methods for that. The fourth part will be detecting the target that's the meat of the presentation, if you will, in terms of the primary and secondary label steps. And then finally, some information on how to visualize your samples, mainly with microscopy and analysis and software. So basically, this presentation goes from the beginning to the end of your immunohistochemistry experience. Let's go into part one, or step one, preparing your sample. There are many different protocols for preparing your tissues, but generally speaking, the most common are either paraffin processing or cryosection processing. With paraffin processing, you fix your tissue after you've extracted it from the animals. 
and then you go on to move it through a dehydration series, usually in ethanol, from water at 0% ethanol up through to 100%. And then into another solvent such as xylene or limonene, sometimes toluene, and then embedding into paraplast, which is a plastic paraffin mix, or histoplast, which is our version of it. The embedding process is, in, is where your tissue is actually embedded in the paraffin, and this paraffin block can be stored long-term, even at room temperature, until you're ready to section it. Once you're ready to section it, then you would put it on a microtome and section and mount it on a slide. Another process is to do cryosection or cryogenic processing. This is where you take your tissue, fix it, and then put it through a graded sucrose series, up to 100% sucrose, and then into an embedding medium. The most common is OCT. We also sell NEG50 medium. And this is a medium that's solution at room temperature, but upon put freezing it at minus 20 or in liquid nitrogen or something, it will freeze into a solid block. You can then store those blocks for sometimes years at minus 20 or better yet, minus 80 degrees uh, until you're ready to section it, at which point you'll take that block, put it into a, uh, a cryo cryostat, which is like a microtome, but, but it's frozen, and the cryostat has blades that will section the, uh, the tissue into thin sections that you can then mount onto a slide. There are a few other uh, methodologies out there, such as vibratome sections or fresh frozen, and I'm not really going to touch on that in this presentation. Also more common these days are whole mounts or even spheroid imaging or 3D cell culture imaging. We have a great web resource listed here at thermofisher.com slash histology that talks about a number of these different preparation methods. Okay, once you've taken your tissue and sent it through that preparation process and embedded and then sectioned, you now have slides with sections on them. But at the beginning of that process, sorry, is the fixation. That's where you take your tissue and you extract it and you fix it with some sort of method. The most common method is cross-linking with aldehydes. For instance, formaldehyde or glutaraldehyde. Formaldehyde is the most common. Both of these form methylene bridges that cross-link proteins together. And by cross-linking these proteins, you pre preserve the morphology of your tissue, as well as preserving the antigen of interest that you're detecting with your antibody. The, back, the problem with this, though, is sometimes you can overfix, which can lead to brittle tissue in some tissue types, and also you can cause masking of antigen binding sites and increased autofluorescence, and I'll talk a little bit more about those issues later. But still, formaldehyde is the most commonly used. There are also fixation techniques that are coagulating. This is using a solvent such as methanol, ethanol, or acetone to coagulate the proteins of interest. Because it doesn't cross-link the proteins, this can preserve the antigenicity of your proteins of tar that you're targeting. And this can permeabilize your sample as well. This is great if you're going for very hard to reach antigens like in the nuclear compartments. However, because it doesn't cross-link proteins, it can sometimes lead to loss of morphology, disruption of the morphology, especially in some fragile tissues. Uh, and this is a big part of some artifacts from sectioning the tissues with your uh, cryostat or microtome as well. And by solubilizing those membranes, it can also cause loss of membrane antigens too. So it's a very good idea to talk to the source of your antibody, your primary antibody, and ask them which fixation technique they recommend for that particular antibody and antigen. Now, when you fix your sample, it cross-links the proteins in place. And this is great because it preserves the antigen in its uh, location. Uh, be aware, though, that some reagents, such as some organic dyes, may be retained with fixation but not technically cross-linked in place, leading to an off-rate where the 
the dye can be lost over time. And I show an example of that on the right-hand side of some organic dyes that when stored at a hot temperature, 37 degrees for 14 days, have come off the tissue leading to lower specific staining. Also, sometimes it's a good idea to post-fix. So you fixed your sample, you do your antibody labeling, then you come in with formaldehyde again. This will cross-link the antibodies in place so that they don't have this off rate leading to lower specific signal. We sell a fixation and permeabilization kit that you see listed here. Now here at Thermo Fisher Scientific, it's a, we are a very large company that, that extends to the full breadth of biological research, including materials sold for these processing techniques. We sell the cryostats and microtomes. We sell all the accessories. We even sell full embedding workstations and tissue processors as well. So that entire process can be automated in those tissue processors. Here's a listing of a few of those products. But again, you can go to the histology landing page to link to many of these. Now be aware that there can be a number of different artifacts from your sectioning technique and fixation technique. I show some examples here. Probably the most common is that the tissue has folds. It isn't lay, le, levelly put onto the slide, leading to folds in it that can lead to these artifacts that you see here, or bubbles under the tissue. So it's important to have a very good technique when you section and lay the tissue down on the slides so that you don't tear it or fold it. Another common uh, obstacle that you face in microscopy, especially with fluorescent dyes, is autofluorescence. Autofluorescence is the native fluorescent background inherent in the tissue. So if you're trying to detect with a fluorescent secondary antibody, for instance, there's a background there that you have to overcome. And it's important that you don't mistake this for your specific signal. Not all tissue fluoresces in all backgrounds for autofluorescence. So uh, it's very important to have a control with no dye on it to see what that background fluorescence is and where it's expressing. This background fluorescence can be worse with aldehyde fixation, so you don't want to overfix. Glutaraldehyde in particular is quite bad. Also, paraffin sections are very bad for autofluorescence. Um, so usually for fluorescent imaging, it's important to go to cryosections if possible. Usually this autofluorescence is very broad spectrum, so you'll see it in, at least in the green and red and sometimes in the blue. Far red is a good idea if you want to overcome it as well. How do you deal with autofluorescence when you have it? Well, I highly recommend doing chemical treatments. Uh, sodium borohydride is a powder you can find from chemical companies like Sigma Aldrich, for instance, and we may sell it on other parts of our company as well. And this is where you treat your tissue after you've rehydrated it. So you have your tissue on your slides, you rehydrate into PBS, and then you treat it with three times 10 minutes of very freshly made, immediately before use, of one mg per mil sodium borohydride in PBS. And as you can see here in this example, the red autofluorescence was knocked down almost to background here um, by treating it in this method. The idea here is that it's breaking down those cross-linkings from the aldehyde fixation that's leading to the autofluorescence. Another way you can deal with autofluorescence is to amplify your signal over it. So for instance, here I can show on the left an image of a mouse cerebellum labeled with a primary and secondary antibody. And the secondary is labeled with Alexafluor 488, which is a green fluorescent dye. And unfortunately, there was a lot of green autofluorescence. So you don't see these Bergman glia, those nice striations there. But if you amplify the signal by instead using an HRP, or horseradish peroxidase labeled secondary antibody, and then detect the HRP with a 488 tyramide signal amplification, you can see now you have a much better, much stronger signal requiring a lower exposure time and now it's so, so much 
more intense than the background, you don't see that autofluorescence. We sell our Teramide Super Boost kits that can help with this. And another, a final way you can deal with autofluorescence is through software manipulation. There are some special spectral deconvolution systems out there that you can use that will do this automatically for you. Or you can use your imaging software where you collect an image in your specific wavelength, like the green here, and you can see little arrows, which are the specific signals of the proliferating cells in this tissue. But there's a lot of green autofluorescence. Luckily, the autofluorescence is very broad wavelength, so if you don't have any specific labels in your red wavelength, you can switch over and take an image from that and then use your imaging software to subtract the red image from your green, leaving the image down in the lower right, where now you can only see the specific spots indicated by those white arrows. Our Celeste imaging software can do that for you, by the way. Okay. Once you've rehydrated your sample and dealt with the autofluorescence, now you need to permeabilize your sample. Now, paraffin sections go through solvent washes, so they're already delipidated. The cells and tissue are, are permeabilized by those solvents, so it's not as necessary for paraffin sections. But for cryosections and whole mounts, it's very important that you do a permeabilization. The most common way is to use a detergent, such as Triton X100 or uh, alcohols. A detergent will poke holes by uh, breaking down that membrane, and by basically poking holes in the membrane, it allows large molecules, like your primary and secondary antibodies, to diffuse down into the cells and attach to the antigens of interest. Usually a 0.1 or 0.2% triton for 60 minutes is sufficient. I also recommend including that detergent in every wash and incubation throughout the protocol, just to make sure you hit it hard. However, there are a few people out there, some researchers who use solvents such as acetone. This delipidizes the membrane and really breaks it down so that you have easy entrance of the antibodies. But you can overdo it, so be careful. The acetone has to be pre-chilled at minus 20 degrees and only wash your tissues for a short time in it, such as maybe 10 to 20 minutes. Um, going too long can really disturb the morphology of your tissue. We sell Triton X100 and other detergents as well. After you've permeabilized your sample, then we move on to step two, which is the antigen retrieval. Antigen retrieval, also called epitope retrieval or antigen unmasking, is a means by which you can reveal the antigen binding sites of your protein of interest, your antigen. Um, which can sometimes be hidden by cross-linking with those aldehydes. The most typical method is to use heat-induced antigen retrieval, where you expose it to a high heat, but sometimes proteolytic digestion or both can be used. Notice that we have a very good landing page for antigen retrieval. So when you do a heat-induced antigen retrieval, which is the most common method, this is where you uh, heat the sample by some method uh, and maybe adjust the pH, either as a low pH or a high pH, depending upon the antibody. The most typical ways to do the heat induction are either with a double boiler on a heat plate, where you take your, your slides with tissue and lower it into the hot solution, or with a lab-grade microwave, or with little devices that are basically little pressure cookers that you put your sample in. A few people even use um, uh, 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 other heating instruments, such as autoclaves, to heat the sample. But anyways, you heat at a very high degree, up near the boiling point of water, up around 100 degrees Celsius. Some antibodies require a low pH, such as a citrate buffer. Others require a high pH. So it's important to talk to the source of your primary antibody to see if it needs antigen retrieval, and if so, which kind has been tested on it. If you label with your primary antibody without antigen re retrieval and you don't see a good signal, it may be that you need an AR method, and so you might try a few different types. <laughs> 
we sell some antigen retrieval solutions, as I mentioned or listed on that previous slide. Here's an example where we tested uh, heat-induced antigen retrieval with the primary antibody, um, heating it up uh, probably in a pressure cooker uh, system, and we tried different pHs. So you can see that you need at least a pH of 8 in that to get a good signal. These were the only images I could find from our company, uh, but it, some antibodies have an even bigger difference. Some you won't even see an antigen expression at all. Here in the brown is a DAB detection, and the brown is your specific signal from the primary antibody. Another way other than heat is to use proteolytic digestion. This is where you use pronase or pepsin, proteinase K, this, um, this breaks down the protein structure around your antigen, allowing uh, your antibody to detect the antigen of interest. Some antibodies require this instead of heat-induced heat antigen retrieval. It's not as common, but it is something that you can find in the literature pretty easily. You have to be careful, though, because if you go too long, you can damage your tissue morphology and maybe even damage the antigen itself that you're trying to detect. So you definitely have to optimize this step very carefully. We sell a number, as you can see here, a number of different proteolytic digestion solutions. Some other notes, uh, antigen retrieval, for whatever reason, is more commonly used on paraffin sections, but I've needed it on cryo sections as well, and even cells on cover slips. So it's not just limited to paraffin. We sell a, a system here, the Lab Vision system, which does a deparaffinization and heat-induced epitope retrieval solution. And we sell many products related to that. Okay, on to step three. Here we're going to talk about the blocking conditions. What is blocking? Blocking is where you're, you're treating the tissue in a way that your primary and secondary antibody are not going to give you a nonspecific signal. So you're making sure that it goes to the target of interest. The most common uh, sort of blocking that you hear about is protein blocking because primary and secondary antibodies will bind to your protein of interest, but sometimes other proteins in the milieu of your tissue. The most common blocking techniques are to use bovine serum albumin, or BSA, or serum, like normal goat serum, for instance, or a combination of those two. There's also a number of commercial blocking agents. We sell blockade solution, for instance. I actually helped develop blockade for this usage. And uh, if you use BSA and NGS, I recommend or maybe a 6% BSA and 5 to 10% serum uh, as a good combination. Our blockade solution comes at a 1x solution, so you can put it right on your tissue, and it works as well and often better than BSA or serum or other homebrew remedies. You can also make your primary and secondary antibodies in blockade. So it's, it's great, and you can see some data here where it's knocked down the background binding on these cerebellum sections almost to the autofluorescence level. And you can see some catalog numbers here too. Also, the e-bioscience side of our company sells some protein blocking solutions that are very good. Now, a form of blocking that isn't commonly known as dye charge blocking. This is where negatively charged dyes, like the alexafluor dyes, will be nonspecifically attracted to positively charged areas on the tissue. In cultured cells, this is nuclei and mitochondria. In cerebellum, like you see images here, it's the white matter in these cryosections. And so uh, protein blocking will not stop this. Instead, you need to use our Imaget FX signal enhancer solution. It enhances the signal in the sense that it knocks down the, the nonspecific binding. Uh, this blocks those positively charged areas, and it's a dropper bottle solution. And then when you come in with your negatively charged dyes, you don't see that binding. So you do your protein blocking first, and then you would come in and drop this solution onto it for 
maybe 30 minutes onto your section and it'll block that binding. Then you can go on to further steps. Additionally, there can be blocking for endogenous enzymes. So for instance, if you come in with your primary antibody, a secondary antibody that has biotin on it, and then detect the biotin with a streptavidin with a diconjugate on it. That streptavidin will not only bind to the biotin on your antibody, but it will also bind to endogenous biotin in your tissues. Um, biotin, for instance, is found endogenously in mitochondria. So it's important to block this. So this step comes in after your your protein blocking. We have a kit where you just drop on a couple of dropper bottle solutions. After your protein blocking and maybe your uh, Imaget FX signal enhancer. And this will block the endogenous biotin so that later you can come in and you won't detect it with your streptavidin. Also, it's very common to use HRP or horseradish peroxidase labeled secondaries and then detect that with diaminobenzidine or a tyramide super boost kit or some other kits. And tissue in particular is very bad for endogenous peroxidases. So you'll want to block with H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, prior to going on to your primary solution. And this will knock down the peroxidases. Or if you're detecting with a, with a alkaline phosphatase labeled secondary, it's important to block the endogenous phosphatases with levamisole before you go on to detect it. We have this web resource here for endogenous blocking methods. Okay, on to step four, detecting your target. When we talk about immunohistochemistry, antibody detection, this is the part that people think of the most your primary and secondary antibody label steps. So you've blocked your sample, you've permeabilized it, now you go on to your primary antibody. This is where a, an antibody such as a IgG has been grown in a host animal and then packaged, so you get a vial of it, and then you dilute it down to maybe five to 10 micrograms per milliliter into your blocking buffer and label your tissue. A typical label will be uh, several hours to overnight at four degrees um, to detect your specific signal. Um, this is just the primary antibody, not the actual detection part, which is your secondary antibody usually. Now, how do you choose a primary antibody? Well, of course, you want to make sure it's grown against the antigen of interest, and you want to go with a company that has good products like us, if I may say so, and consider the clone of your antibody. Some clones are better than others, and sometimes when you search for an antibody, like on our antibody selection tool, as you see down below a link for, uh, there will be two or three different clones. Sometimes in the literature, it'll say one clone or another, so you can go with that. Monoclonal versus polyclonal. Uh, monoclonal will be specific to like IgG, whereas polyclonal, especially in rabbits, uh, polyclonal isn't specific to one isotype or another. Uh, make sure your antibody is within its stability period. So most of our antibodies are uh, guaranteed for several months if stored correctly. Uh, once your antibody gets to a year or more, I would be very concerned about its stability, even if stored at minus 20. So be careful about that. Check that the antibody is recommended for immunohistochemistry. Uh, some antibodies are only validated for Western blot analysis, for instance, or flow cytometry. And those aren't always good for a very complex system like a tissue section. So make sure it's uh, validated for immunohistochemistry or maybe immunocytochemistry or ICC, which is labeling of cells and culture. And finally, and very importantly, consider the host species and isotype that you're choosing so that it can be matched with your secondary antibody. So for instance, if you have a mouse tissue, you, um, you don't want to use a, a mouse primary because then you, your secondary will detect the endogenous IgG in your tissue as well as your primary. Um, there are kits that can overcome this if necessary. 
But if I had a mouse tissue, I'd, for instance, go with probably a rabbit primary antibody, and then I could come in with an, maybe a donkey anti-rabbit secondary. It's important to make that connection. Okay, how can it go bad? So sometimes an antibody, uh, maybe it's degraded, or maybe it's not the right clone, and you don't get specific signal. Here's an example on the left of good staining of a paraffin section. The blue there is hematoxylin for nuclei, and the, the brown is your specific signal for the antigen of interest, detected with diaminobenzidine, or DAB. And you can see on the left, you have good specific staining in the region of these tonsils that you want, whereas in the right, you see brown labeling all over the background, which is nonspecific. Also, um, the concentration has to be very carefully titrated. So if you haven't used a primary antibody before, it's good to try a number, number of different concentrations and label time to get just the right expression. So, for instance, here you can see on the left uh, some cells that were labeled with too much antibody. And, and so this was an antitubulin. So you don't see the nice fine tubulin structures. And instead, you have this mass around the, the nuclear region. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see the, the right concentration, 5 micrograms per mil in this case, where you get good detection of those fibers without blowing it out. Also, as I mentioned, is antigen retrieval needed. If you have too little of a signal, it could indicate that you need an AR method to express the antigen of sight. Or maybe that, um, maybe the, if you're not getting a signal, maybe the primary is degraded. For instance, here's some examples where the primary antibody was degraded. On the left are some cells where I was detecting Golgi bodies and uh, in the upper left, you can see there was a lot of background in the nucleus and off-cell and on-cell background. Um, a new antibody cleared that up. On the right was an antibody that, um, instead of giving nice fibers, you see a sort of pearls on a string look to the fibers, and that's because it was just degraded. So fresh antibody is very important. <clears throat> Okay, so once you've labeled with your primary antibody, usually overnight at four degrees, you'll wash, and then you'll come in with a secondary antibody of choice. Usually the secondary antibody, uh, you'll label for maybe a couple hours, two to four hours at room temperature, and it's labeled typically with a dye, like the Alexaflor dyes, or sometimes a uh, biotin or an enzyme. Again, as with the primary antibodies, go with a trusted company and go with the protocol that that company recommends. Make sure it's in its stability period and is fairly fresh uh, within a year at the very longest. Make sure it's uh, got the correct host and target. So if I have a rabbit primary, now I want an anti-rabbit secondary to detect it. And as I mentioned, you have to choose whether you want to dye or an enzyme. We have a great selection tool, as you can see a link down below, where you can go to choose an antibody of interest. <clears throat> and there's a number of different types of secondary antibodies. For instance, whole IgGs are the most common because they give you the strongest signal. They're relatively inexpensive, um, but they can have some cross-reactivity. What do I mean by cross-reactivity? Well, for instance, if you have a, a tissue section with two different antigens you're wanting to detect, one antigen you want to detect with a mouse primary, one with, a, say, a rabbit primary. You then come in with a secondary against the mouse and rabbit primaries, but you don't want your anti-mouse to detect your rabbit. That's cross-labeling or cross-reactivity. And you don't want your anti-rabbit to detect your mouse. So it's important when you buy the antibodies, if you're doing multicolor labeling, that you check the cross-reactivities from the company. Make sure your, for instance, anti-mouse secondary has been cross-absorbed against a rabbit and vice versa. FAB2 fab uh, fragments are much more specific to the FC receptors on the primary antibody of target 
but you have a lower degree of labeling of dyes, so it's not as strong of a signal. If you're doing multiple primaries on the same tissue, it's a very good idea to have highly cross-absorbed secondaries that have been cross-absorbed against multiple different species so you don't have that cross-reactivity problem. And finally, sometimes we sell subtype-specific antibodies. So for instance, if you have two different mouse primaries on the same tissue, one can be an IgG1 isotype and the other can be an IgG2A isotype. And if you have subtype-specific antibodies against IgG1 mouse or IgG2A mouse, you can use them in the same label step and not have to worry about cross-labeling. And again, you have to optimize your labeling time and concentration. As I mentioned, two to four hours at room temperature is typical. And a concentration might be somewhere around five micrograms per mil. And again, in a blocking solution. Usually bovine serum albumin is fine, or in our blockade blocking solution. Here on the right, you can see a DAB labeled section in brown, where the brown is your specific labeling. Always optimize. Now, the, uh, I'm talking about research use in this presentation. Clini clinical analyses, you can't optimize because it's already been pre-optimized. So be aware that if you're doing clinical analysis, you have to stick very carefully to a uh, prescribed protocol. Now, uh, DAB, which gives you that brown deposition, this is where you have a primary antibody, then you come in with a secondary antibody that has horseradish peroxidase, or HRP, and then you do a chemical detection, which precipitates brown anywhere that the HRP is localized. However, you still have to optimize label time and concentration. So on the left here is an example of mouse ileum that was not detected with the right concentration and label time, leading to low signal. And on the right here is now too long of a DAB detection. So now you have brown everywhere. So with the proper development, you can get a very specific labeling on the antigen receptors of interest, for instance here in breast cancer section. How do you choose the dye of interest? Sometimes you'll go with a chromogenic dye like DAB. This is where you use transmitted light microscopy to see it. Or you'll go with a fluorescent dye like Alexafluor 488 where you use a fluorescent microscope to see it. How do you choose? People often have uh, in, in their labs specific protocols that they use, and it's fine to keep following those, but I recommend being open to one or the other method and maybe trying both. Um, for instance, with fluorescent detection, you can get more labels on your tissue because you're now detecting only within a very specific wavelength, green or red or far red. So now you can get as many as four or I've done as many as six different labels on the same tissue sections. However, now you have to deal with photo bleaching effects, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. And maybe it's uh, got more of an off rate than you do with chromogenic slides, whereas chromogenic slides like DAB and other chromogenic dyes, uh, you mount in a solvent-based mountant and can save the slide for years often, and it's fine for that. So there are drawbacks to and pros and cons for each of these. Now, sometimes you don't want to do a direct detection. Uh, sometimes instead you want to do an amplification technique. This is where you amplify your signal over background. This is very important if you're detecting low expressing antigens or if you're trying to overcome autofluorescence. So with a uh, direct label conjugate, this is a primary antibody that has a dye on it, you only get a, you know, maybe two dye molecules per primary, and that's not sufficient for tissue usually. Sometimes in cell detection, especially with flow cytometry, which is more sensitive, it's fine. Now most typically we go with a, a typical secondary antibody with a dye on it. But again, if you need amplification, you might want to go to a streptavidin biotin. This is where your secondary antibody is labeled with a biotinylated, um, and you can go on to that with a streptavidin detection, 
and this will give you 20 to 40 dyes per target. That's often sufficient. However, sometimes there are very low expression targets, so now you want to go to uh, HRP tyramide detection, or DAB. And this is where it deposits a, with tyramides, it deposits a fluorescent substrate around the site of a horseradish peroxidase labeled secondary. And this is a huge amplification, 120 to 200 dyes per target, which is great. Uh, now you get a very nice, strong signal. But why would you not want to use these, for instance? Well, here's some examples. So you have to scale it to the amplification or abundance of your target. So in a high abundance antigen, like tubulin, for instance, on the top row, um, this, this antigen is very commonly expressed in cells with a large amount, so a direct detection or a typical secondary detection is fine. And you can see some nice specific fibers there. But if you go with tyramide signal amplification, now you blow it out, right? You get much too much expression, you lose the nice fine fiber expression there, and it's very, very bright so bright even that you might have to throw in neutral density filters on your microscope. You don't want all that. But if you're going with a low abundance target like catenin on that lower panel, now you need to amplify your signal in order to see the few proteins that are expressed there. A direct conjugate is not nearly good enough. A typical goat anti-mouse secondary here shows a specific signal, but you're seeing some background there too. So now if you amplify with tyramide signal amplification, now you see a nice bright specific signal that's adjusted over the background. How do you choose the dye of interest if you're going with fluorescence? Well, you want to make sure that you know which filters or wavelengths you have on your imaging system and match dyes to those. And you want to make sure that if you're doing multiple different colors on the same tissue, that the dyes are spectrally separated from each other. We have a very useful tool online called the Spectra Viewer, and you can see a link here. And this is where you can list numerous different dyes all together and see how they, their wavelengths overlap. You can even put your excitation and emission filters or laser lines into those tabs, and it'll display it so that you can tell whether or not the dye of interest uh, overlaps with your filters very nicely. Pretty much all of our dyes are in this spectra viewer. One problem that, with the detection method is bleed through. So for instance, let's say you have two different dyes on your tissue, a green dye like Alexafluor 488 and an orange-red dye in the Psi 3 wavelength like Alexafluor 555. Here's an image that was taken uh, in the green filter with Alexafluor, uh, Alexafluor 488. The specific signal in the 488 is that punctate spot, uh, those spots which are peroxisomes. But now in the green filter, you're seeing these striations there, which is actually the Alexafluor 555, which was so bright that now you can see it in the green filter. What do you do about that? Well, you can reduce your 555 labeling intensity by reducing the label time or concentration so it's not so bright and bleeding through. Or you can choose not to use the 555 and go with a dye that's farther separated, like Texas Red or Alexafluor 594, or on into the uh, far red dyes. And now it's not likely to bleed through into your green channel. You can also use imaging software or special spectral deconvolution systems to separate the signals. Controls are very important, so let me spend a moment on that. So I mentioned earlier autofluorescence controls. This is where you take your tissue, you wash it and permeabilize it and mount it as you would the other sections, but you don't have primary antibody or secondary antibody. All you want to see is how bad is your background autofluorescence without any dye present. If it's very high, then you do your sodium borohydride washes, but hopefully there's no signal. Also, you want a no primary control. This is where you omit your primary antibody, but you still use your secondary antibody detection. 
This will check to see if you see any background just from your secondary antibody detection method. If you don't, you're good to go. If you do see background, then you might want to go in and readjust your secondary label time or maybe have better blocking solution, more stringent blocking, or maybe your antibody is degraded. Finally, if you're doing multiple colors on the same tissue, do a cross-labeling control. This is where you have only a single color. So let's say you're, you're wanting to use a mouse and rabbit secondary on the same section. You'll go with only one, so just mouse primary, but instead of detecting with your anti-mouse secondary, you detect with your anti-rabbit secondary to see if it cross-labels. Hopefully it won't. And vice versa, you also have one with your rabbit primary and you come in with the anti-mouse secondary and hopefully you won't see binding. But it's important when you start doing a, a, a series of assays that you check this. Here's an example with a no primary control. So on the left, we omitted the primary antibody but still detected with an HRP secondary and DAB detection and hematoxylin for nuclei. Whereas on the, in the middle there, you can see a picture where the brown is your specific DAB. This is where we did use the primary antibody. So now you can see you're getting nice specific labeling with almost no background. Finally, after you do your primary and secondary antibodies, now you can counterstain your sections. The most common is to do a nuclear detection. So in fluorescence, you might detect with DAPI or Herxt in the blue to label the nuclei. In, in chromogenic sections, you might label with hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin is blue or purpley nuclei. Eosin gives you this light purple or reddish color for this cytoplasm. In fluorescence, also, there's a number of different uh, counter stains. For instance, uh, here in the magenta color is uh, six, Alexafluor 647 phalloidin, which labels the actin of the microvilli in this intestine section. Very pretty. I love phalloidin. It's a toxic protein found in a, a deadly mushroom, but it sure detects actin great. Finally, after you've done your, your uh, detection or your, your counter stains, now you want to mount your sample and detect it on your microscopes and do a, a software analysis of it. So let's talk about mounting medium. So after you've done your labeling, you have to put a cover slip on usually, and that cover slip has to have a solution underneath it. That's your mounting medium. For fluorescent samples, you want to make sure that there's an antifade present. An antifade mounting medium will slow the photo bleaching, and I'll talk about that again in the next slide. If you want to just visualize your sample under the microscope and then throw away your slide, you want a non-curing or liquidy mounting medium that does not harden, such as our slow fade diamond antifade mountant. If you, wanted to, uh, if you want to archive your slides for imaging later, days to weeks later or even months, you want a hardening or curing mountant. Uh, for fluorescent samples, I recommend our prolonged diamond antifade mountant or prolonged glass. Uh, for chromogenic slides, you'll often go with uh, Cytoseal 60 uh, or Histo mount, for instance, or DPX which hardened very hard. You have to chip it off if you wanted to remove it. Whatever mountant you choose, make sure it has a very good refractive index close to glass, like the glass used in your cover slip and your objective lens, usually around 1.52 for the best resolution. This will ensure that you have good resolution, especially at the high magnification objectives. If you're doing fluorescence, make sure your mountant is not itself autofluorescent to give background. Photo bleaching, so if you have a fluorescent sample, when you shine light on it using your microscope, you'll notice that the dye starts to go dim over time as you're looking at it. That's photo bleaching. It's a, um, it's a photophysical effect on the structure of the dye, causing destruction of the dye structure, uh, and so it stops fluorescing. You can use anti-fade mounting mediums like prolonged gold and pro prolonged diamond, prolonged glass. These have components in it that are antioxidants. 
and free radical scavengers that can vastly slow this photo bleaching effect. I highly recommend you use an anti-fade mounting medium for any fluorescent detection. We have a web resource down there at thermofisher.com slash antifades to help with that. Also, we've recently re introduced prolonged glass. So if you have, especially if you have very thick samples, uh, the refractive index is very critical in order to image deep into the tissue. Um, so with prolonged glass, we've demonstrated you can image 70 or even 100 micron thick samples and still detect the signal down deep inside uh, with very good resolution. Compare, for instance, to a competitor of ours here where you can't see so far. A huge improvement in depth of detection. Whole mounts, very thick samples, uh, and spheroids, for instance, are becoming much more common now. So this is becoming a more important product. Here, for instance, you can see some Im images of spheroids labeled with a couple of our dyes, uh, Cell Rocks Deep Red, Miter Tracker Orange, and Herxt for nuclei, um, that have been imaged as deep as 100 microns with our prolonged glass. Okay, let's talk about the instrument platforms. Uh, typically, you'll want to use a microscope. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds out there. Uh, the most common is a wide field microscope, either inverted like our uh, FL Auto and FL Auto 2 that you see here on our EVOS product line. Uh, but there's a lot of different microscope companies out there. Uh, wide field means that you don't have any specialized techniques to uh, limit just your plane of view. But there's also confocal microscopes, which use optical properties to uh, image only a thin section through your tissue at a time to cut out extraneous light above and below where you're wanting to image. There's also multi-photon systems and light sheet microscope systems. So there's a lot of different systems out there. But whatever system you use, there are some important hardware concerns. Always make sure everything's clean. You know, use clean slides and clean cover slips without debris on them. Uh, make sure your objective lens, lenses are cleaned regularly and professionally. Um, and choose your objective lenses wisely with the right uh, objective magnification, uh, numerical aperture. Uh, align your light source. So with us, uh, with our EVO systems, we use an LED light cube which has the light source built into it. So there's nothing to align, which is marvelous. But a lot of typical systems out there will use a, a mercury bulb, for instance, that has to be carefully aligned so it's in the center of your view and um, adjusted so that's uniform in intensity. Our systems don't need that. Also, the condensers, if you're doing transmitted light, you have to make sure that your condenser is aligned so it gives nice centered and uniform illumination. Again, our EVO systems, there's no alignment necessary for that. Also, um, make sure that you have the right filter sets or light cubes for your dye choices. I mentioned the spectra viewer earlier. So here you can see an example in the middle of typical light cubes used in typical imaging microscopes for fluorescent imaging. Our EVOS microscopes use special light cubes that you see on the right, which has everything built into it, including the light source. Um, on the left here, you can see an example of an image where the light source was not carefully uh, uniform and centered, so you see it's brighter on the left than on the right. In the middle is an example of an objective lens that has not been cleaned well. You can see little specks in the center there of debris that's on the lens. It's quite common in microscopes that if people are doing high mag imaging that they accidentally get immersion oil on non-immersion oil lenses, which can be difficult to clean. So talk to your image facilitator to make sure that it's cleaned correctly if you accidentally drag Im immersion oil in a non-immersion oil lens. Also in this image, you can see the objective is butting up against the stage, which can damage the objective. So you have to look for damage too. Be very careful. By the way, here's a good link to our EVOS microscope systems. Just contact us if you're interested in those systems. <laughs> 
Remember, proper hardware gives you efficient detection. What's the point in going through all that protocol to label if you're not going to have the best hardware to detect it? All right, once you've taken your image, um, well, when you, when you have your microscope, remember that your imaging, you have to have special imaging software to capture it with your camera system. And you have to optimize those image settings very carefully, namely the exposure time, that you're detecting, uh, the gain setting on your camera, the light intensity, if that's adjustable as it is with our EVO system. With confocal microscopes, there's a number of other factors you have to take into consideration, like your laser intensity, the rastering back and forth on your sample, the pinhole size. And just taking the image isn't enough. You also have to think about how you're saving your image. If you, if you have a JPEG, format, for instance, remember it compresses the image, but it also preserves in eight bits the color, as well as maybe a scale bar or other annotations. But if you're doing quantitative analysis, where you're comparing the intensity between images, you want to save as a 16-bit, usually 16-bit TIFF image, which is black and white. It doesn't save the color or scale bars. But this is important because that, that gives you the full dynamic range of the camera at 16 bits so that you can more carefully compare the quantitative relative fluorescence between the images. Here's an example screenshot from our EVOS FL Auto 2 imaging system and the software used. And you can see some little bars on that lower right that you can adjust the light intensity, exposure, and gain settings, as well as the focus. This image here is of a, a kidney section labeled with Alexafluor 488, and it's pretty dim. So I would say this is too dim. You can adjust the lighting, but now uh, the light and exposure time are too high. You can see you're saturating the signal. Matter of fact, the software will color the saturated pixels blue. So you want to back off on that exposure time to something like this. This is an optimized image. So there's little to no uh, saturated pixels or it's subsaturation. This is where you want to be, as well as good focus. Here's an example of some cells that I took, which are not a good image. Um, you can see that the cells are not centered in the image. Uh, the green wavelength, you can't really pick out very well because it's too low of an exposure time or gain setting. The red is a Texas red for mitochondria, and it's too bright, uh, too long of an exposure time saturating the pixels. And there's a bit of blue background. Maybe it's a little hard for you to see here. Um, whereas if I optimize all that, now you can see a much better section. Uh, or image here, where uh, the actin is nice and bright in the green, the mitochondria are not too bright, and I've adjusted the gain so that the DAPI signal and the nuclei is not too much in the background. Remember, optimized settings gives you accurate data. Once you've taken your images, now you want to go to image analysis software, not acquisition software, but analysis software. ImageJ, for instance, is a freeware out there, but it can be a little bit difficult to use. It's not very user-friendly. We offer here at Thermo Fisher Scientific the Celeste imaging software, which is combat uh, com compatible with our EVOS line of microscopes. And you can see here a three-color image where each of the three colors is in black and white, blue, green, and red, and I've merged them in the lower right. You can also adjust, here you can see in the red box, the uh, contrast and gamma uh, and brightness of the image. And with image analysis software, now you can analyze your images. The most typical way to analyze, to compare intensities between sections or, or sorry, images, is to use a region of interest. Here you can see in yellow some regions that I've drawn. Uh, on the cells for this uh, uh, tubulin labeling, sorry, actin labeling, and a circle in the background so that I can subtract the background fluorescence from the specific fluorescence. Another way to detect or measure your cells is with thresholding. This is where 
uh, in blue here, I've selected a certain range of intensities that I want to measure. But this is too low. You can see there are areas that are not selected. Here, that's much better, um, although maybe it's over-selected a bit. And here, it's way too high, so I've over-thresholded. Now, with our Celeste imaging software, it has the, a smart segmentation where you can actually train it over the course of just a few seconds to a minute to detect only the regions of interest and subtract out the regions of non-interest. So you can see this is very nice uh, actin detection with our smart segmentation. Whatever you do, segmenting your cell, uh, actually, let me go back. Uh, the Celeste software has a lot of different capabilities beyond just uh, uh, measuring intensities. Uh, you can even do like 3D uh, visualization, or you can count cells with it, or do a parent-child analysis, or uh, look at cell migration over time. There's a lot of different uses, but I'm not going to go into all the functionalities of Celeste software here. Okay, and then finally, I want to just say a few words about imaging ethics, and this is something that's not touched upon enough out there. What can you and can't you do to your images? Uh, first off, never add anything to your image except maybe annotations. Uh, you want your data to be very honest. Um, uh, if you do do any post-acquisition manipulations, there are some very important points to keep in, in mind, okay? So don't add anything to your image except annotations. Don't selectively enhance one area without performing the same manipulation on the whole image. Don't compare two images that have not undergone the same post-acquisition manipulation. So you don't want to brighten one image and dim another and compare them, because that would just be false data. And don't crop your images in any way that would remove valid re relevant data. And if you do crop it, just make sure to um, you know, do that to other comparable images as well. Uh, for instance, if you're focusing only on one area. Whatever changes you make, make sure that it's reflected in the text of your paper or even in the captions of the image, always. Remember, ethical imaging means trustworthy data and replicable data. Okay, and then finally, these last two slides are just some great links that you can go to if you want to come back to this presentation later. We have a number of different immunohistochemistry and histology and immunocytochemistry pages and articles on our webpage, and here are many of them. Uh, that third one there is the, this webinar, specific to this webinar, uh, the five steps to publication quality images. And then finally, there's some other useful web resources. I mentioned the Spectra Viewer, for instance, but we also have Fluor 4 Selection Guide, uh, our Molecular Probe School of Fluorescence that talks about a lot of the basics of imaging. That's a really great page. I highly recommend that anyone starting out or undergrads, or even if you just want some refreshers, go to the School of Fluorescence to get some great tips. Okay, so I'll open up for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jason, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. Okay, let's get started. Jason, our first question is, what is the difference between immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry, and immunocytochemistry? Are these terms interchangeable? Well, sometimes people use one for the other, but technically speaking, immunohistochemistry deals with immunolabeling of tissues. Immunocytochemistry deals with immunolabeling of cells and culture and both of which fall under the general umbrella of immunofluorescence. Sometimes you'll see them uh, abbreviated as IF or IHC or ICC and used interchangeably even on our web pages. Um, 
but often one that's good for immunohistochemistry is also good for immunocytochemistry. Okay, Jason, our next question. Now, it seems to be a lot of different permeabilization detergents in immunoprotocols. Triton X100, Tween20, Saponin, NP40, and a couple others. Now, how do I choose between them? That's a good question. The most common detergents that are used for immunoprotocols are non-ionic detergents, especially Triton X100, but also Tween20, uh, NP40 or non-IDET P40, as it's also known, is also used sometimes. These are pretty strong uh, detergents that poke holes in the membranes, but they're strong enough that they can also extract proteins associated with the membranes. For mil most immunocytochemistry and histochemistry, those are the most typically used because you really want to make some big holes there for these large antibodies to enter. But this can be a problem, especially for those uh, membrane-bound proteins if you're trying to detect, for instance, surface antigens on cells. And in those cases, you might want to use a gentler detergent. Saponin, for instance, uh, which is named from soapwort, a plant. It's a plant-derived uh, detergent. Actually interacts with membrane cholesterol, selectively removing them and leaving smaller holes in the membrane. Uh, often saponin is used for flow cytometry. Um, and then there's some others like digitonin, for instance, uh, that are even gentler. But generally speaking, triton is probably the most popular. Thank you, Jason. And that brings me to this next question that we've received several, from several attendees. Now, what do you recommend for cleaning objectives? Detergent, ethanol? Uh, when, you want, when you discover that there's uh, some debris or something on your objectives, first you want to sort of spritz it off with a little air can. If it's actual uh, debris that's stuck on the lens, such as dirt uh, of some sort, uh, then the next step is to use a gentle detergent. Uh, there's a common one called Sparkle out there. It's pink colored. But each of the microscope companies also sell detergents. Um, and what you'll do is you'll use a, uh, a, a lint-free lens paper and a cotton-tipped applicator. You'll put a drop of that detergent on and use the lens paper and the cotton-tipped applicator on top of the lens paper to roll that paper across and absorb off the detergent with just a little bit of force from the cotton-tipped applicator and some slight circular motion. And this will remove most of the debris that may be on there still. In some cases, though, that debris doesn't come off with a gentle detergent. Uh, immersion oil, for instance, is very difficult to get off. Uh, in those cases, um, you can go with ethanol, which is a gentler solvent, uh, or isopropanol to put a drop on there and again remove with clean uh, lens paper. You don't want to use really strong solvents like, for instance, chloroform or acetone unless you absolutely positively have to because those stronger solvents can degrade the glue around the lenses. Thank you, Jason. In the interest of time, this will have to be our last question. But I want to remind our audience that any questions submitted during the presentation that were not answered out loud Jason will be answering them via email following the presentation. Now, Jason, we have a viewer and they, they're stating they, after they mounted their slides, they found that there were bubbles under the cover slip. What can they do or what can he do to get rid of them? Hmm. That's a good question. Uh, bubbles can come from several sources. They can come when you're actually dropping the mounting solution down onto your sample Sometimes bubbles will come out of your dropper. Other times there can be air trapped inside the tissue. And when the mountant cures or hardens, it'll compress the tissue, forcing the 
the air out of that tissue. Usually, if it's from the tissue, it's very tiny bubbles that appear only over the tissue. Whereas if it's uh, air droplets that come out during the deposition of the mountain, they're usually larger and often off, off the tissue section. Uh, if you're using an aqueous-based mountain like our Prolong products, you can remove the cover slip by putting the slide into warm PBS solution, maybe at 37 degrees with a little bit of movement, and it slowly dissolves away the prolong and the cover slip will slide off. And at that point, uh, you've lost the air bubbles and you can remount the sample with some new prolong. If you're mounting a, in a solvent-based mountant, though, you have to actually use solvents to remove the mounting medium, and it's not always successful and can cause damage to your tissue also. Uh, that's another reason to use an aqueous-based mountant. Thank you again, Jason. Now, before we go, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. And a quick reminder that the questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. I would also like to thank Labroot and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed um, on demand through October 2018. Labroot will alert you via email when this is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you.